So now we're going to look at the idea of a Markov decision process, which encapsulates the idea of reinforcement learning concepts all in one single framework. It's a really powerful model, but in order to get there, we're going to have to start with some basics. We're going to get there in three steps. So the first step is to define what a Markov chain is. A Markov chain or a Markov process is basically a memoryless random process, okay? A sequence of random states that happen with a particular property which we call the Markov property. The Markov property states that we don't need any information about past states to model the present, okay? So a Markov process or chain is basically a tuple of states and transition probabilities. Okay, so you can think of it as a, a bunch of states and from each state you can get to another state with some likelihood, okay? And that's defined by this P matrix that allows us to understand what's the probability from going from a source state to a target state. So this particular matrix then has a, uh, uh, a formalization which where each row contains all the transition probabilities of moving from one state uh, to any of the other states, including itself, right? So all of the entries along the diagonal here are cases in which um, the likelihood that we're staying in the same state at a particular time step, okay? And so what we have is basically some type of uh, finite state space because uh, S has to be a finite a set of spaces, okay? And a transition probability where each row has to sum to unity. We need to know where we might end up in the next state. So here's an example of a Markov chain that might be modeled on a student uh, taking a course like the one here. Okay, so let's imagine that we start in class session one. Okay, and uh, with this class session one, we can move to another state. We could decide to goof off and perhaps uh, browse or take a break. We might look at its Instagram for a while. So uh, with a 50% chance, we might do that. But instead, we might actually try to bone up and actually work on our project a little bit more and proceed to study and go to class session number two. Okay, and so you can see where we're going with this is that every basic uh, state here has a transition probability to another state. Okay, so um, the transition likelihoods, the p-values are uh, located on the edges in this diagram and the states are on these green circles. Now states can have a, any number of transitions. They can have a, a transition just to itself. So basically you stay in that state all the time. So when you sleep, maybe you end up in that state for the rest of this example. But in other cases, you can transition out, okay? So for example, um, many of the states in this diagram have two possibilities, but there's at least one here where we transition to uh, the club, right? Going to the club, we might have three different things that happen, right? We might have forgotten what we uh, understood uh, in uh, class sessions one, two, and three, and we might have to start all over. Okay, so there are some uh, episodes that you can roll out by taking any of these transitions. You could arrive at another state. So you could start at class session one, for example, and um, going on this line over here, we might proceed to class session two, class session three, uh, pass the course, and then finally sleep. So you got uh, all the way through our, our example. On the other hand, you might actually go the other way around, right? You might have decided to go Instagram for a couple rounds and then uh, come back and uh, fall asleep in the uh, after class session two and actually not finish the course. Okay, so this matrix here, because not all of the arrows are illustrated for all the transitions to the states, it ends up to a sparse matrix that we can see on the right hand side here where we have each row indicating a source uh, state and each column indicating a, a target state. So for example, here we can say, what's the probability that I'm in uh, class number two and I decide uh, not to actually uh, go to sleep, but actually to continue studying. And that has an 80% probability as illustrated with the, the arrow here. Okay. So that's helpful. 
But that's not the whole thing, right? Because when we think of a Markov decision process or in short, a uh, reinforcement uh, learning algorithm, we need to also encode the idea of rewards. We said that we need to give the agent occasional information about whether it's doing things right or wrong. And the way we're going to model that is through a reward system. So we're going to define a layer on top of the Markov chain called a Markov reward process. Okay, So it's basically just adding on top of the Markov chain uh, another set of values, two pieces of information over here, which specifies a model of a reward as well as a discount factor. Okay, So uh, the model of the reward is a reward function, which we might know. Okay, It's dependent on the state. So once I'm in a state, then I know how much uh, the expected return is going to be for arriving at that state. Okay. For, um, sorry, for leaving that state at a certain time point. Okay, so it says here, I'm at a state at time t, that state is called s, and what's my expected reward for having left that state? So um, we can see where that will go. Okay, secondly, we have a discount factor. We're not going to talk about it so much here, but in the later lecture in the post, we're going to see how this affects our understanding about future rewards. All right, and so you can see what this looks like when we layer it on top of the same example. All right, so in this student Markov reward process, we are um, adding the rewards. Okay, and here the only positive reward that we get, just like in chess or another long range game, is a positive reward at the end for actually finishing our course. So we get a positive uh, reward of plus 10. Okay. And of course, the longer we fiddle or um, hesitate or goof off, the, the less reward we are getting, right? Because it's taking longer for us to do this studying. So the way we're going to model that is by adding a negative reward for all of the other states, right? So here you can see that pretty much all of the other states I have a negative too, okay? Instagram is not so bad. Maybe I learned a little bit of information. So it's a, a negative one here. Uh, and maybe going to the club to uh, de-stress and make friends, uh, that's also a good way. Uh, I may get a slight positive value for that, okay? So I'm assigning at this point rewards for each state. And so what I mean by a reward is again, after I'm in a particular state, when I leave that state, what's the reward that I get? So for example, being in class session two, I don't have any reward yet, but when I leave class session two, I spent some brain power either leaving by going to Instagram or by going to class session two, I have to pay a penalty, this re negative reward of minus two brain power, if you will, in order to satisfy going to the next state. All right, with those two steps, we're now ready to tackle the idea of a Markov decision process, right? A Markov decision process adds a couple other things, right? It's basically saying a reward process, but now the agent gets to make decisions, all right? So we are adding in this A factor, which is a model for what types of actions a particular agent can take in a state. Okay, and now our transition probability as well as our reward function is going to be more specific. It's going to be conditioned not just on the state, but also what action the agent takes when they are in that state, right? So you can see here, I need to know basically what state, what action am I taking, and then what's the likelihood that I'm going to end up in a certain state for the next time step. Uh, likewise here, we have the same thing when we're talking about our rewards, okay? So in a reward system or a model of rewards, which we are going to denote as a script capital R here, it's going to be conditioned again on the state and the action, just like our transition probability, but we're going to have it give us a reward. The reward doesn't have to be deterministic, okay? It's just an expected value. So we may need to sample it in the case of exploration, but we're going to come up with a function, okay, a, a model for how much reward we would get by taking a certain action at a certain state. 
Okay, so this is what I said already. In NDPs, rewards are indexed not only on the state, but also on the action, okay? So this is the case for both the transition matrix uh, script P as well as the rewards that we get, uh, which is we, what we've denoted as script R here. And so what does this look like? Okay, in our student Markov decision process here, we've added uh, the rewards, uh, but we've also added the actions, right? All the actions here are in purple. And, um, you know, for the most part, you can see there's no difference in uh, what state, uh, what action leads to what state here. Okay, so um, here, by default and convention, we are leaving out all the action nodes where there is only one outcome of the action. Okay, being in a certain state, you can take a certain decision. So, for example, being in C2, I could decide to sleep or I could decide to study, and I would get the same outcome, right? Either I end up in the sleep state over here, or I end up in the uh, third class, and that's all good, okay? There are some exceptions to that, right? So you can see here, uh, when I choose the action of going clubbing, it's a stochastic case, right? So our script P is functioning differently. It's not a deterministic function what happens next, right? I might end up forgetting enough that uh, I end up wind up all the way back in class number one and had to restudy the entire course from scratch. Or I could say that I end up in C2 having forgotten a little bit or, you know, just had a little bit of fun and come back to where I was studying in C3. Okay, and with that, we finished our introduction of Markov decision processes. We're going to look at this more in detail when we get to the post-lecture on how it's used to actually solve problems.